Well, today we're continuing this series that we've been in for the last uh, three weeks now uh, called Real Christmas. And for those of you who are brand new, not only welcome, but just a quick uh, update, overview. Uh, for this last year, as a church, we've been uh, studying the life and teaching of Jesus uh, as seen through the eyes of one of the leaders of the early church. He's a man by the name of Mark, and, uh, and he write, writes a gospel uh, of according to Mark where he kind of describes the life and teaching of Jesus. But uh, Mark doesn't include any of the, the birth, the events that surround the birth of Jesus. He picks up when Jesus is an adult at 30 years old, launching his ministry. And so what we've been doing in this series is going back, picking up some other accounts from Matthew and Luke to the other Gospels to kind of fill in the picture. Um, and then what we're going to do is that uh, at the start of the year, we'll go back into the Gospel of Mark and finish our third and final series uh, on the life of Jesus. And so uh, what, one of the things I've mentioned the last couple of weeks is that when you come to Christmas, is that uh, I, I love Christmas. I love uh, so much of what it stands for, you know, the friends, the family, uh, the gifts, the lights, the tree, and so on. This week I got chocolate-covered pretzels. How awesome is that? And so uh, that was just a, definitely the winner. Uh, and so you know, so I love so much about Christmas, but um, as a Christ follower, as a Jesus lover, uh, I, I am uh, often concerned about, kind of mixed emotions about Christmas, because I think often as a culture, and even as followers of Jesus, we often miss what real Christmas is about. And uh, I'm not talking just about kind of the obvious sorts of things like keeping Christ in Christmas or saying Merry Christmas and Happy New Year or Happy Holidays, something like that. But I'm talking about what was it like to really be there at that first Christmas? What would it have been like? What would we have seen? What would we have felt? What would we have experienced? Uh, and even more than that, uh, what are these key events of Christmas? What parts do they play uh, in the larger story that God is telling of our salvation and the rescue, his rescue mission of the race? And so what we've been doing uh, every week is going back in time, kind of recreating some of these key events that we have uh, often know the, the bare bones, kind of the story of, but we don't really know what it was really like, try to recreate that, and then ask the question, what does this tell us about who Jesus is, why he's come, uh, what it means to follow him? And so today we're going to continue that. And today we're going to go back to one of the key events we actually started this series uh, with, and it's back in Matthew chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, let's go back to Matthew 1. If you've got your apps, go ahead and turn them on. Uh, what I want to do is just do a quick review. There on your note sheet, there's a section called The Christmas Story, A Quick Review. And what I want to do is just kind of set this up, because we did look at this passage a couple weeks ago, but we skipped over a key part of it intentionally so we could come back and, and dig in deeper today. So if you were here a couple weeks ago, we, we, we talked about this concept of scandal, that uh, as 21st century Christ followers, we often miss this, but when the story of Jesus happened, the birth of Jesus happened, it was a complete scandal. Uh, we, we have this uh, uh, betrothed young couple, which means by definition, they're, they're planning on getting married, they haven't slept together, uh, and all of a sudden she comes up pregnant uh, in the midst of a culture that was totally unacceptable, and uh, you're kind of signing up for a life of shame. This child's going to be a bastard, the mom's considered uh, uh, adulterous, and so uh, this throws, uh, throws their whole lives into uh, just kind of catastrophe. And so uh, Joseph is, is really praying about this. He wants to do the right thing. I remember in the Old Testament, it says that uh, if, if a, the, the man or the woman they, who are betrothed, if they have sexual relations with someone else, that they're actually to be stoned. And by the time of Jesus, they weren't practicing that, but you would typically divorce, and that's kind of what the law would require. And so uh, he's got a heart for this young girl, probably 12 to 14 years old, that he's going to be marrying. And uh, he doesn't want to expose her to any more public shame. And so he decides pri to do a private divorce. Uh, but in the midst of this, after he's decided this, that night, he goes to sleep. Angel shows up. Remember, we talked about this. They were no more used to angels in their day than we are in ours. Uh, this would have been just as big a shock to him. Uh, angels were something you read about in the Bible back a long time ago. Uh, and so uh, Angel shows up and, and gives him this message. And that's where I want to pick up the story today. So if you have uh, your Bibles, again, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. And so it says, after he had considered this, this is Joseph, uh, he's made the decision to divorce her quietly. An angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David. And remember, that was important because the Messiah was prophesied to come through the line of David. And for that to happen, if you have a virgin birth, he has to be adopted by uh, a, a someone who's legally from the line of David. 
And so uh, Joseph, her husband, uh, is from that line. So she's pledged to this man. And uh, after he considered this, says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife. And we talked about that. So many reasons to be afraid. First of all, you're afraid of disobeying God in his word. It says she's to be stoned. They're actually divorcing these days. But, but you know, so is that really the right thing to do? Uh, but on top of that, like I said, you're signing up for a life of shame. You know, how old's your son? Oh, he's 13. When did you get married? Uh, you know, so it's just a very awkward, you're gonna, your whole life, you're going to be tagged with this. She's an adulteress. He's a bastard. You're the guy who married her. This whole thing is wrong. And so uh, the lot of reasons to be uh, afraid in the midst of a shame-based culture. And so uh, the angel says, hey, don't be afraid because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Uh, whether, uh, whether she had told him the story or not, we don't know. But if she did tell him, uh, he had not bought into that story. And so now the, the, the angel is saying, hey, the story is true. This is a supernatural conception. It's going to be the Son of God. And so uh, she will give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus, which means Yahweh is salvation, because he will what? Save his people from their sins, right? And we'll come back to that later. And so then, then uh, Matthew throws in, sidebar, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And this is from the prophet Isaiah. And this is the part I want us to focus in on today. This prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where the prophet said, a virgin will be with child, and she'll give birth to a son, and they'll call his name what? Emmanuel. Let's say it again. What's his name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That's the point today. Uh, which means what? God with us, right? So we, we see this uh, every year on Christmas cards. We sing it in songs, this name Emmanuel. And so uh, this, this is what I want to focus on today because in a way, you could take the whole Christmas story, the whole Christmas event, and you could kind of boil it down into this one key word. And if you understood this one key word and the history of this word and all the backstory of this word, uh, it would pretty much summarize everything about Christmas. And so what I want to do today is talk about the history, the backstory of this word, Emmanuel, God with us. And there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Emmanuel, the backstory. And so what I want to do today is go back in time and, and recreate, kind of go back to what you might call the meta narrative of the Bible, uh, the big picture story of the human race and how this story fits in, into that larger story that God is telling. So let's go back in time for a couple minutes. Let's go back to the very beginning of our race. Let's go back to the creation. And so the story the Bible tells is this amazing God who's creative, who's brilliant, who's beautiful, who's powerful. He creates this inc inc incredible cosmos. And the more scientific research we do, the more we understand the size of our universe, the complexity of our universe, the brilliance of our universe, as so we create this incredible universe, creates a place for us to live, and very early in the story is a race we rebel. We create, we commit high treason against our true king. We buy into the lies of the great enemy. We're deceived. We, we follow to the, the wrong side. And as a result, death comes to the race. And, and not just physical death, but death at every level. Emotional. A spiritual, our relationship with God is broken. We were before God was with us. Now His race no longer with us. That relationship has been broken. Psychologically, we don't have peace. We live our lives in worry. We live our lives in fear. We live our lives in greed. We're going to talk about this on Christmas Eve. Uh, that we, we lost the peace that we are created to experience. Socially, our relationships are broken. Marriages break up. Families break up. Friendships break up. We're a broken race. Physically, our bodies are, are racked with, with illness, with sickness. People die. Uh, 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 sociologically, cultures collapse. Uh, there's death at every level, and not just, uh, uh, not just at, the, at the micro level, at the macro level. All of creation is fallen. We live in a world of tsunamis. We live in a world of earthquakes. We live in a world of natural disasters. Death comes into this cosmos as a result of our rebellion. But there in Genesis 3, a promise is made that one day a great deliverer will come who will rescue our race and restore all of creation, turn all wrongs to right. And we begin on this journey, this story. 
And as we get to the nation of Israel, as God chooses this nation to begin to bring, to bring rescue to us, uh, we, he, we call them out of Egypt. They're now at Mount Sinai. God appears to them. They enter into covenant. I will be your God. You will be my people. They say yes. It's like a marriage ceremony. They say I do. And God says the very first thing I want you to do is I want, to, I want you to build a place for me to live. I want you to catch this. I want to come and be what? With you. Emmanuel. God is coming to his people. So he says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to build a, build a tent. He says, you all live in tents. You're out in the wilderness, you live in tents. I want you to build me a tent. But my tent's going to be way cooler than your tents. And I want it to be right in the center of the nation. I want you to build this tent. It's be very specific plan. It's going to be a very symbolic tent. We're going to do sacrifice here. I'm going to meet with you here. I want to be with you. It's got to be built just like this. And once you build it, I want to be right in the middle. I want three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south, three to the east, three to the west, right in the middle. And I want to dwell with you. There are your note sheet. You see in Exodus 25, he says, have them make a sanctuary. We often call this a tabernacle. And I will, what's the next word? Dwell. Dwell. Circle that word. It'll become important later on. I will dwell among them. And so sure enough, they build this incredible tabernacle. And when it finally gets built, God comes. Remember the movie Field of Dreams? If you build it, he will come. And so they, they build this incredible tabernacle, and, and sure enough, once it's dedicated, ready to go, God comes. And so there in your note sheet, it says, then the cloud, from Exodus 40, the cloud covered the tent of what? Meeting. It's a place where God meets. And the glory of Yahweh, Lord, all caps, Yahweh, the glory of the, the light, the brilliance, the power, the beauty, the glory of Yahweh fills the tabernacle. And from that point on, in the travels of the Israelites, remember the next 38, 40 years, Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud didn't lift, they didn't set out until the day it lifted. And so, and so God was teaching them, not only do I want to be with you, but I want to lead your life. I want to be in relationship. I want to come and dwell right in the center. I want to be your God. You be my people. I want to love you, learn how to live in a relationship with you. And I want to lead your life. And so when I move, you move. And when I stop, you stop. This is a beautiful picture that God's... God's painting for them. And so now we jump forward several hundred years of time. The nation of Israel is now uh, in the land of Israel. They, they're no longer living in the wilderness. They're no longer a bunch of uh, 12 tribes, you know, just huddled together around the, around the tabernacle. They're spread throughout the whole nation. And so God says, we want to build, a, you need to build a new place now. It needs to be at one central location where a people, a place you can come and meet with me, a place where the sacrifices can be offered, a place where your sins can be forgiven. It'll be the place where heaven touches earth. It will be the holiest place of all of creation. It will be the place where God comes. And so sure enough, under David and Solomon, they build this incredible tabernacle. It comes time for the day of dedication. They put the sacrifices on the huge altar. Fire from heaven comes, consumes him, and God comes. If you build it, I will come. And so there in your note sheet, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Yahweh filled the temple. God came. But if you know the history of the nation of Israel, you know their history is one of rebellion and disobedience. Not because so much there was something wrong with Israel, unusual, you know, it's just like we're all this way, right? We all have this fallen nature that pulls us away. So they're kind of a case study of the human race. And so, you, so what happens is over hundreds of years, they rebel against God over and over again until finally God removes them from their nation. They lose the land. They're exiled in 722 BC. The nation of Syria overtakes the northern kingdom and takes them into captivity. 586, the final uh, final incursion of Babylon into the southern kingdom, and they destroy, uh, they destroy the southern kingdom. They take away the captivity. They lose their land. They're taken away from a thousand miles away from home. And when Babylon comes in 586, they destroy the temple. The temple. 
the place where heaven meets earth, the place where God dwells, the place where he meets with his people, is completely destroyed. At the time of Jesus, the temple had been rebuilt, a small remnant had come back to the land, the nation had grown again. There was a temple in Jerusalem, King Herod the Great had built it, unbelievable place, one of the wonders of the ancient world. The, the campus of the temple, temple campus, was three football fields long, six football fields wide. It was an incredible place. But I want you to catch this. The glory had never returned to that temple. God had never come. And so the nation was waiting. The nation was praying. Rabbis were praying for the day when Messiah would come and bring the glory back. When God would come again and rescue them from their sins that had led to this situation. And now we understand the backstory of Matthew chapter 1. Because when the angel came and said that a son was being born and that God was coming back to the nation, you begin to understand what that means. In fact, in John's gospel, John describes it in exactly these terms of God returning to the nation to tabernacle with them again. In fact, they're on your note sheet. In John chapter 1, this is John's version of the Christmas story. You remember how John 1 starts? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And then you jump down to verse 14, and here's how John describes Christmas. He says, the Word became flesh, and He made His what? Dwelling. Circle that. Guess what the Word is in Greek. The Word is tabernacle. And the Word became flesh and He tabernacled with us. Emmanuel. God's coming. And this time God is not coming to fill a temple. This time God's filling, coming to fill a person. God has come to be with us. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 2, some of you may remember this, it's one of the early scenes in John's Gospel. Jesus has just got this massive temple complex. He's, he's made a whip. He's overturned the, the, the money changer's table. This apparently happens twice. John puts this one right at the beginning of the Gospel. The religious leaders, the political leaders of the nation are irate. They come to Jesus. Who do you think you are? What gives you right to rearrange the temple, the place where heaven meets earth? The place of God's foot, uh, you know, of God's presence. What gives you the right? I don't know if you remember what Jesus said. He said, destroy this temple. And they've been working on this, by the way, for 46 years. Destroy this temple. I will rebuild it in three days. I said, are you crazy? I've been working on this for 46 years. John inserts sidebar. They didn't realize he was talking about the temple of his body. You see, God was coming to the nation. The glory was returning to the nation, but not in a temple made by hands, in the temple of his body. And so if you go back to John 1, this is exactly what John 1 says. The Word became flesh, and He made His dwelling amongst us, and we have seen His what? His glory. The glory of God is coming back to the nation of Israel. The glory of God is breaking into the human race, that God has come to be with His people, and His name is Emmanuel. And so in this larger story that God is telling, the story of a world in rebellion, 
rebelled against our true king, relationship broken, we're under judgment, we're his enemies, and yet this amazing love story, a God who loves us, continues to come after us, continually moving closer, creating a nation through which Messiah to come, comes and is with them in the tabernacle, with them in the temple, and now heaven meets earth, not in a temple, but in a person, Emmanuel has come to rescue us. This is the story of Christmas. And the question is, how are we going to respond to the reality of Emmanuel? And there in your note sheet, there's a section called Emmanuel, Our Response. And I've got a couple questions, and, and they're really for two different sets of people. Like in a room like this, uh, there are only two kinds of people. Um, two and only two. Right? So, so there are people who have responded already to Emmanuel and people who haven't responded yet to Emmanuel. And so I've got a question for each group. And so the first question is for those of you who have not yet responded to Emmanuel. So, so you'll be the person that, if we're having coffee at Starbucks or whatever, and they say, hey, so you're a pastor. And he yes, you figured that out. And so we're talking, and I've got my mocha, and you've got your caramel macchiato or whatever, uh, uh, fruit for drink. So uh, anyway, uh, we're, we're talking, right? And so... Uh, I ask you, where do you stand with this whole Jesus thing? Like, are you a Christ follower? Are you a Christian? Not, where does he believe in God? Where you, and, and you would write, you would I didn't say, you know what, I, I don't really believe in Jesus. I don't really believe I'm not a Christian. I'm whatever. I'm a nothing, or I'm a this, or I'm a that, but I'm not a Christian. So if that's you, I want to talk to you for just a second. And the question is, God has acted in human history to invade time and space in this person we call Jesus. Emmanuel has come. And the question is, how do you respond to that? Uh, in a few days, uh, we're going to begin Christmas Eve, Christmas, and we're going to be giving and receiving gifts. Right? So probably most of you here are going to be giving some gifts and you're going to be receiving some gifts. Well, when someone gives you a gift, you have to open the gift, right? You have to unwrap the gift. You can't just leave the gift under the tree. You've got to respond. You've got to open it up and go, ooh, or whatever. Uh, and, you know, then you, then you have to decide, am I going to keep it or am I going to give it away? Right? Or this would be great for someone else. I'll save it and re-gift it next year. Uh, save it two years and give it back to the same person. They don't know the difference. But uh, anyway, so you have to open it up and then you decide... Am I going to receive it, or am I going to reject it? Right? And we all do this. It's very normal. This is what you do with a gift. You do a gift. If it's kind of the middle ground, you save it for a year or two, so if they ask you, you can say you still have it, then you give it away. Right? But, but, uh, but you have to respond. And so, so the story of Christmas is that God has given us a gift this gift is his presence. This gift is his son. This gift is Emmanuel who's come to offer to save you from your sins. And so you have to respond or reject. It's, it's one or the other. There's no middle ground. You respond or reject. And so if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, the question is, how are you going to respond to this reality of Emmanuel? And so you may be here for a variety of reasons. You may be here because this is Christmas season and God is drawing you. There's a hunger in your heart. There's got to be more to life. Maybe I can find that out if I go to church. You know, and so there's a spiritual hunger and you're actually seeking. Some of you may have not been seeking at all. You may be in from the East Coast and your relatives said we're going to church. It's Christmas. You're going too and you didn't want to say no and so you're here. <laughs> and you're like, how much longer are we going? Gosh, my church is only 20 minutes. All right. <laughs> Come on, let's get with it. You know, we've heard the story. Uh, but whatever your reason is for being here, the question is, how do you respond? Because what I found, and we've talked about this series, is in our culture, most people know at least the, the bare outline of Christmas story. Most people have heard about Joseph. They've heard about Mary. They've heard about the pregnancy. They've heard about the donkey. They've heard about the camels, they've heard about the wise men, they've heard about the manger, they've heard about the shepherds, they've heard about the star, they've seen the carts. They Watch Charlie Brown Christmas. We kind of know, we kind of know the bare outlines, but but most people in our culture don't understand the story. They don't understand where Christmas plays in this larger story of salvation that God is telling. 
And so if you're here today, the message is being given to you perhaps for the first time of who Jesus is, why He's come, God with us, He's coming to be with you. There's a gift on the table. You have to decide whether to unwrap it. The offer is to save you from your sins, a whole new life, and you have to decide whether to receive it or not. So the question is, are you receiving Emmanuel? That's the question. First question, for those of you who have not given your life to Christ, the question is, are you receiving? A gift has to be rejected or received. There in your note sheet, there's a great, great quote from John's Gospel. This comes right before the passage we just read about, about the Word becoming flesh. And John describes Christmas like this. He came to that which was His own. Talking about the Word made flesh. Talking about Christ. He came to that which was His own. His own creation. His own people. But His own did not what? Receive Him. So Jesus came. He made His claims. He did His miracles. He rose from the dead. But most people did not receive it. It says, but to those who did receive Him, they responded. They came under His leadership. They received His offer. They asked Him into their, their life to, to lead it, to guide it. To be God with them. He said to those who did receive it, He gave the right to become children of whom? Children of God, right? Born again. Three chapters later, Jesus will talk about being born again. Something that happens when a man or woman comes to Emmanuel, to Jesus, and says, would you forgive me? Come into my life. Change me. Teach me. Lead me. I, I want to be on your side. I want to know you. That when that happens, God comes a miracle happens a spirit, on a spiritual level. A new birth happens. We are born again. Our eyes are open. We see who Jesus is. Life is new. We have a new future. God with us, Emmanuel. And so the question today, if you've not yet come to Christ, is, is why not? What's holding you back? And I want to encourage you to go on a journey and to pursue this God who's pursued you and ask Him into your life. It's as simple as ask it. Christmas is a gift. It's a free gift. And if you will give your life to Christ, ask Him into your life, forgive you, restore you, He will come. Emmanuel, Christ will be born in you this Christmas. And the second question is for those of us who are Christ followers. You say, I've already gone through that. I've come to Jesus I gave my life to Christ. I believe in Him. Uh, I've asked Him to forgive my sins, enter into my life. The second question then is for you. And the question is, are you pursuing Emmanuel? And this is a powerful question because the story that we've told today is an amazing story. It's an amazing story of a God who loves us, pursues us, and comes after us, enters into time and space to rescue us, but these are only the opening chapters of the story we call Emmanuel. There's actually a couple more chapters in the story. And it turns out as you, as you continue on the story of Emmanuel that the reason Emmanuel came, the reason Christ came, was not just to forgive us. He came to restore us, to heal us, and catch this, to live inside of us. There's an amazing passage of Scripture. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul is talking to some new Christ followers. They've come out of a very pagan background. They were sexually very promiscuous. And now they're, they're learning as Christ followers to, to surrender their bodies to God, live lives of sexual purity for His glory. And in that context, to talking about your bodies, Paul makes this incredible statement. And it's a statement that we often as Christ followers have become so familiar with, we miss it. Like real Christmas, we miss the obvious. I want you to go back in time. I want you to go to the first century A.D. The temple is still standing in Jerusalem. If you've been raised as a Jew, you've been taught your whole life, it's the holiest place on earth. It's a place where heaven meets earth. It's a place of God's presence. And along comes the Apostle Paul, and he says something incredibly profound. It's there in your note sheet. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he writes to these new Christ followers who've just received Emmanuel. 
And he says to them, do you not know that your body, he's talking about your physical body, like pinch yourself right now, it's that one, right? He says, don't you know that your body is a what? A temple of the whom? Holy Spirit. Do you see what's happening here? The Apostle Paul says the reason that Jesus came was so he could come closer. Through his life, his death, his resurrection, your sins have been forgiven so that the God who invaded the tabernacle in Exodus 40, the God who invaded the temple in 2 Chronicles 7, that God has come to invade your life. That as followers of Jesus, we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. That God has come, Emmanuel, to be with us, to lead us, to guide us, to transform us, to heal us, to teach us. Like the cloud by day or the fire by night, to guide our lives, Emmanuel has come. This is the story of Christmas, you see? That Christ came and took on a body so he could come and live in you and live in me. And catch this. One of the the jobs of the temple is to reveal the glory of God. When Solomon prayed over that first temple, he said, God, may this be the place where all the pagan nations of the world, they come to discover you because here you will be revealed. And men and women, I want you to catch this. That when you came to Christ, the calling on your life is that you would be the temple of God where God moves in so that his glory can be revealed. Think of what Jesus said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Your life is to be the temple of God. And when you love people, And when you serve with passion and you choose what is right and good and true and you truly care about others and you lay down your rights and you give sacrificially to extend his kingdom and you use your spiritual gifts, what's happening is that others are seeing the temple of God and they're seeing the presence of God in and through your life. We're the temple. I think the challenge for us as Christ followers is often like Israel, we take this privilege for granted. And so like Israel of old, God comes, he fills the temple with his presence, and for a while they're blown away, and they just want to meet with him and come regularly and, and meet with God and offer their sacrifices and seek him at the temple. But as time goes on, they get busy, they get distracted, they begin pursuing other gods. Sometimes they'll even bring their other gods into God's temple. They'll begin to disobey their God, not walk with God, not honor Him, and yet come into the temple and go through the motions of offering sacrifice, the ultimate act of hypocrisy. And often in our lives, we can get distracted, can't we? And we can forget what an incredible reality that we experience. We come to Jesus and we become the temple of God. And so the question this Christmas as we get ready for a new year is are you pursuing Emmanuel in your temple? You know, are you listening to his voice? Are you coming under his leadership? Are you letting his word transform your life? Are you using your gifts? Are your finances reflect your passion for his kingdom? Is his glory being revealed in and through your lives? Are you loving people well? As we go in this new year. Because this is why he's come, to be Emmanuel. Now, this is not the end of the story. There's one more chapter. And if you go back to the very beginning of the story, we rebel against God as a race. There's death at every level. Not just personally, psychologically, sociologically, relationally, spiritually, physically. But there is death cosmically. We've been separated from our God, and so all of creation falls. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, this current world groans as if in the the pangs of childbirth. 
waiting to be released. We live in a fallen world. And so at the, the, the story starts in Genesis, the first three chapters, the story of creation, the story of rebellion, and the story of promise, and the story of death. That's how it starts, the first three chapters. And when you go to the last two chapters in the Bible, it's, it's the story of restoration and healing and God coming back and us being restored again of Emmanuel. And there in your note sheet, there's a final section it's called Emmanuel, the final chapter. And in the last two chapters of the Bible, we have this uh, vision that John the Apostle has. And I want you to, to read it now in new eyes. The story, this, this meta-narrative God is telling about Emmanuel. Uh, John says, I heard a loud voice from the throne. In other words, from the throne of God. Saying, now the what? The dwelling. Does that sound familiar? God came to dwell with them in the wilderness in the tabernacle. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now God is coming to dwell. All things restored. All things healed. And He will live with them. Catch that. Emmanuel. He will live with them. And they will be His people. And He will be their God. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death and no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain for the old order of things has passed away. Why? Because God has come. You see, it's a story of Emmanuel. And so as we enter into Christmas, let's take this story of Christmas, this chapter of the events that surround the birth of Jesus, and let's put them in context in the, in, in the right place in the larger story that God is telling. A story that begins in chapter 1 with incredible creation, a rebellion, a death, and a promise. A story that ends at the end with God coming and restoring all things, all of creation, and right in the middle, we have a chapter called Christmas. When the God who created all time and space broke into his creation, became a part of the human race, that he might be with us, that he might restore us, and that we might become the people who reveal his glory in the midst of a world that desperately needs it, we might be prepared when he returns. Let's pray together. Jesus, we are so thankful for that. We are so thankful when the angel came, he said that you'll be a son that's born and you will call him Jesus. Yahweh is salvation for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place. The words of the prophet might be fulfilled. The virgin would conceive and be with child and he will be named Emmanuel for God is with us. And that's how the story of your life starts. And the very last words you said to us when you left is from this point on, I will be with you to the end of the age. And so as king over all of creation, as God of this world, all authority has been given to me. And so go into all of creation and share the message of my life, my birth, my death, my resurrection. And when people come to faith, baptize them in the name of the Father who sent me, of the Son that I am, of the Spirit who will fill them and teach them to obey everything that I've taught you. And I promise I'll be with you every step of the way. And God, we are thankful for that story. We are thankful for the beginning. We're thankful for the end. And we wait for your coming. And we pray that this Christmas, God, would be a new revelation in our life that the God of creation has come to be with us, and He is with us. He's with us in Christ. He's with us as Father. He's with us as Son. He's with us as Spirit. He guides us by cloud by day, by fire by night. And God, the prayer of our heart is that we would would be with You. As You are with us, we would walk with You. We pray as we go this season into friends and family, Some who don't know you, we pray that we would be a place where your glory would shine, that your love would shine through, your light would shine through. And that through our lives in this Christmas season, others would come to know. And so God, we thank you for this day. We can kick off this Christmas season together in this place by celebrating the God who came to be with us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.